This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're here in West Belfast with Emma Campbell, who is co-chair of the Alliance for Choice uh, and a photographer with the Exile Project. You'll find out what that is in just a minute. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Emma. So talk about what is happening here in Northern Ireland around choice and reproductive rights. In 1967, when the UK government introduced the 1967 Abortion Act, which allowed uh, women in England, Scotland and Wales access to an abortion with the sign-off of two doctors, uh, it was never extended to Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland had its own par parliament at the time, it was a devolved parliament and they never introduced the Act. Of course, since then, um, there have been many occasions when Northern Ireland hasn't had a devolved government and have been directly ruled by uh, UK and Westminster. And in that long period of time, the Act was never uh, extended to Northern Ireland, it was never introduced. And in fact, on a number of occasions when there was an attempt to extend it to Northern Ireland, uh, politicians in the DUP, which is the um, Democratic Unionist Party, but um, regardless of the name, they're not very dem democratic, but they're very pro union with uh, the United Kingdom and they're very uh, conservative with a small c, very uh, religion and come from a kind of Protestant uh, loyalist background and they were extremely opposed to any extension of the 67 Act to Northern Ireland and in fact did uh, a number of deals with the UK government um, to vote for some of measures for internment and so forth. Uh, with the UK government in order to stop abortion happening in Northern Ireland. So um, we've been on this kind of path of struggle for abortion rights since then. Um, there's been a lot of activism uh, amongst women in Northern Ireland from the 60s and 70s, uh, especially uh, the trade unions were amongst the first to adopt pro-choice policies and try and campaign around the idea of getting abortion extended to Northern Ireland. Where do abortion rights stand in Ireland? So uh, the two jurisdictions of Ireland, so Northern Ireland and the South of Ireland, um, the South of Ireland recently had a change in the law to bring it up to almost the same as what we have in Northern Ireland, which is um, a woman is uh, entitled to termination if her pregnancy um, will put her at risk of death or grave risk of suicide. So it's a, a very small percentage um, of the women who actually need abortions have real access to it. And even women who qualify in those very strict circumstances of, um, often can't find the medical practitioners who will perform the abortion um, and still then they have to travel to England at a, um, a huge expense. So um, in England, Wales and Scotland, if you need an abortion, you can avail of it on the National Health Service, which means you don't pay for any treatment. Um, whereas if you're traveling from the north or south of Ireland, then you have to pay for your travel, your accommodation, and then of course the, privately, the private treatment as well, which is hugely expensive. Has Scotland just told the women in Northern Ireland, if you come here to get an abortion, we will pay for it, the National Health Service will pay? So Scotland were the first uh, other jurisdiction that offered an olive branch, as it were, to women in Northern Ireland and suggested that they would look at the costing for the um, services, abortion services, if we travel to Scotland for them. Um, and then in a, in a very kind of fast, volt fast over in um, UK Westminster, because the uh, Theresa May mm. is struggling with this um, snap election result, so she didn't have the majority that she imagined she might. So Theresa May wanted to do a deal with the DUP in order to have a greater majority and um, to appease a lot of the members of the Tory party who were scared at how um, right wing the DUP were, she um, then started making noises about uh, introducing measures that meant that women from Northern Ireland would get their abortions paid for in England. Um, Stella Creasy from the Labour Party in fact put the amendment into the Queen's speech and from that it kind of you know snowballed into a situation now where there are actually talks happening about getting women's treatment paid for in England. Obviously it still means women have to travel from Northern Ireland and it has no impact on women in the South because they're not part of the UK so they still would have to pay privately and travel. So 
What do women do now in Northern Ireland? Um, we know from our um, sisters in an organisation called Women on Web who uh, provide abortion pills to women in countries where abortion is still illegal that um, over a period of about three years over 5,000 women access just their pills online and they're only one of many providers. You, you don't necessarily have to go to Women on Web or Women Help Women. You can go to just a private provider in China or India on the internet. But we know from um, Women on Web's research that over 5,000 women in the last three years have accessed these pills, which are illegal to take in Northern Ireland without, um, you know, without a medical practitioner involved. And um, women have been prosecuted when they have been discovered to have taken these pills. Um, often they have been reported to the police by medical practitioners if they've gone to hospital because they're not sure if the bleeding is normal or if they face real complications and have gone to hospital then the nurses and healthcare people that they meet there are unfortunately obliged under a Northern Irish Terrorist Act to report any crime. So, uh, so yeah, we've had one prosecution last year and then about four or five cases that are currently waiting in the courts. And they're waiting because there's a few Supreme Court actions uh, kind of in the mix that I think uh, they're waiting to hear the results from that have been appealed a few times. So um, the maximum penalty is uh, life, um, life imprisonment. Um, but the woman who was um, uh, charged last year got a custodial sentence and uh, that means? means that she didn't have to serve any of the sentence because the amount of time that she was uh, the amount of time that she waited between being charged and going to court was the same as the amount of the sentence that she was jailed that she was jailed um, but uh, we know that she was actually saving up money to travel and then took the pills when she couldn't get enough money. So the financial burden is a huge, a huge part of this access problem. Estimates of how many women a day leave on average Northern Ireland to get an abortion? Well, between one and two women a day um, leave Northern Ireland. We know that uh, 12 women a week leave Northern Ireland and 40 women a week leave uh, the south of Ireland. Um, it's approximately 1,000 women a year on average and about between four and five thousand women a year on average that have left the Republic. So that's thousands of women who've just been left behind for such a long time. So talk about what a photographer like you has to do with this movement, what you're doing now, what the Exile Project is all about. So the Exile Project uh, was really envisioned as a way of showing solidarity a way of removing the stigma and the silence and secrecy around abortion, because obviously that p plays a huge part in uh, moving the ideas forward. Uh, women have had to, when they travel over, they quite often pretend they're going over for a different reason, that they're visiting family or they're going on a business trip. or um, And the Exile Project wanted to have something that showed that there are lots of women just like you and me who have had to access abortions and so these are women who are willing to put their face forward and say I've had an abortion and it's the first time really anything like this has happened in Ireland north or south um, so it's been quite amazing and the response has been overwhelming. No, explain what you're doing. You are so taking... we, um, we photograph women who've had abortions and we don't ask them their story or ask them to explain anything. We just take their first name and their face and portrait. Portrait. And um, we publish we always publish the portraits as a group rather than as individuals um, because it's about talking about how many women have had to um, go through this alone before. So this is a gallery of women yes. who've had abortion. That's right, yeah. And a lot of them have found um, consequently, as a part of doing the Exile Project, as, as being one of the faces in the gallery, a lot of them have found their way to being more active in the fight for abortion rights. And certainly, you know, for many of them, the sky didn't fall in. So it's been a very empowering project for the women involved. Can the authorities get a hold of these pictures and track these women down? 
Well, we, there's no uh, attached evidence to um, how they accessed abortion. So, of course, um, there was a, a move in the south of Ireland to try and even make travel to England illegal, but that was quashed um, uh, in the 80s. So, um, there's no way of telling how these women accessed the abortion and whether it was illegal or not. So, Are the women you're photographing only from Northern Ireland or from uh, the Republic they're of from, Ireland as they're well? They're from the whole of Ireland, so from North and South. And what's the experience like, Emma, for you as the photographer to sit across from the woman? How do you set this up? Where do you take these pictures? And how do they feel when you're shooting them? Well, one of the other organizers, um, Julie Morrissey, she arranges uh, that we contact each other. Um, and then I ask them to just decide on somewhere that they would feel comfortable. And um, when we meet, we quite often would have coffee first and have a chat. And um, I never ask anyone their story, but uh, nine times out of 10, they want to share their story. I guess because they know that they're talking to somebody who, who understands where they're coming from and isn't going to be from a place of judgment. And uh, they've been from all different backgrounds, from medical consultants to uh, teachers and retired women and stay-at-home moms. So it kind of spans the breadth of, of just different women in, in the country. And this is for women who've had an abortion any time in their lives? That's right, any time. And um, sometimes it's more than one, obviously, um, given the span of your um, reproductive years. So it's, uh, and every woman's story is different, but everyone's experience is definitely overshadowed by the stigma and shame, which is part of what we're trying to remove with this project. What do the polls show here? I mean, in the United States, the majority of even Catholics support choice, support abortion. What about here? So there have been a number of, of polls over the last few years. Um, Amnesty has um, um, carried out a poll specifically in the South and in the North as well, so two different in the two different jurisdictions, but they reflect each other, which is that across the board, across religion, across uh, socioeconomic background, um, people, over 70% of people in Ireland, North and South support abortion rights and support a change in the law. Um, there is a tiny minority that supports the law as it is and wish to see women criminalised, but it's less than 10%. The United Nations um, has called Ireland's abortion laws cruel and inhumane, calling for a change in the law. Uh, we would agree. and. Um, with my other hat on as part of Alliance for Choice, we've made submissions um, to the uh, to CEDAW, which is the Committee on Ending Discrimination and Violence Against Women as part of the UN. We've made submissions to the UN Committees on the Child, on um, Disabilities, and on um, the Rights to Sexual Freedoms. And in each in each instance, the response that we've had from the UN is that they agree with us that um, there are definitely human rights that are being breached. Um, a lot, um, especially around Article 8, Article 13 and Article 14. And um, that really, unless the um, punishments here are removed, so the criminal punishments are removed, that um, there's no way that you can say that women's rights are being properly up upheld. How many women have been charged? Um, we don't know. Um, but we know that the amount of women that are waiting to um, get a judgment in court is currently about six. So um, people only started being arrested once the popularity of the online pills became wider, wider public knowledge. Yeah. Mm. You talked about the DUP. How about Sinn Féin? What's its position on abortion? Well, Sinn Féin recently changed its position on abortion to um, agree with abortion in um, cases of rape, um, in cases of fetal abnormality or sexual crimes. So um, f as you know, um, that's the very kind of baseline of, um, <laughs> that's the kind of extreme circumstances of people that need abortions, but they're, that will only cover a very small percentage of the amount of people that actually need access, and it's not far enough. But they are further on than the DUP, and in the South, they do support the repeal of the Eighth um, Campaign and the, the Eighth Amendment in the Irish Constitution 
actually um, enshrines the right of the fetus to be protected and that was inserted um, in the 80s and they need that to be removed before they can progress in any way with any abortion law. Are you concerned with the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, making coalition with the DUP, which is fiercely anti-choice, that it could change the laws of the rest of Britain? I think that what we've seen uh, over the last month has shown us that the people in government at Westminster want to protect the rights that are already there, thankfully. However, uh, it certainly, unfortunately, lets the DUP off the hook in terms of making any uh, legal policy decisions on abortion in Northern Ireland. And uh, as an activist and as a member of the activist community fighting for abortion rights, we are worried that this is now seen as, you know, this is dealt with. We have abortion rights because you can travel to England and Scotland and Wales and access it for free, where in actual fact there's a an awful lot of women who for very many reasons can't travel, um, women in situations of domestic violence, people who don't have the proper travel documents, recent immigrants, um, and people with disabilities that mean that travel across to England for them is just impossible. Um, so we believe it still leaves far too many women behind and we're just concerned that um, the will of the people here isn't really being listened to. Finally, your thoughts on what's happening in the United States under President Trump? Well, uh, there was a lot of reflection took place when Trump, in the run-up to the elections, talked about how he believed that women who had abortions should be punished. and. Uh, rightfully, many people were horrified about his comments, but in actual fact, that's what happens here. So I guess for a, a warning to people of America that um, you could be living in this kind of situation if Trump is left untrammeled in his, in his opinions. Um, but also there's a, a very worrying influence of American politics, especially on the hard wingers in this country and in the UK. A lot of the um, training manuals for the anti-choice people that operate and who bully women outside clinics come directly from America. So, Exile Project, the name? The X dash X -Dash. Dash. Dash. Project. Yeah. Where does it come from? Um, I guess because so many people feel like they're exiled as citizens whenever they have to travel over to um, other countries for abortion. So we really feel like we've been undermined as citizens and, and devalued as kind of state members. Well, I'm McCampbell. I want to thank you for being with us, co-chair of the Alliance for Choice and one of the ph photographers with the um, Exile Project. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. This is Democracy Now! We're in West Belfast in the north of Ireland. I'm Amy Goodman. And thanks for joining us.